Well, most of you know that I grew up in a minister's home, and uh, one of the things, the joys of being a minister's daughter is that uh, I got to learn a lot of children's songs because I was always in Sunday school. And uh, ministers, children don't ever miss church, but uh, that was one of the blessings, not a burden. And a lot of the songs have stuck with me all of these years, even though I'm older in age now. And one of them that I can still remember is uh, one that I believe was taken from this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. And the words to the song go like this. The wise man built his house upon a rock. The wise man built his house upon a rock. The wise man built his house upon a rock, and the rains came tumbling down. And I won't sing the rest of it to you, I won't bore you, but you know the story. The rains came down, the floods came up, the rains came down, the floods came up, and that house stood firm, right? But then it goes, there's a foolish man. He built his house upon the sand, and guess what? The same thing happened. The rains came, the floods came, and what happened to that house? It went splat that's how we would say it and so the conclusion is what build your house on the lord jesus christ build your house on the lord jesus christ so i often have wondered um, you know i'm sure the writer of that song had the sermon on the mount in mind especially this last portion now as catchy as that child uh, that childhood song is the words from jesus's sermon that it was taken from are far from catchy more like astounding and he fills in just a little bit more detail than that catchy song i learned as a child so let's listen to what jesus has to say as he finishes these words to those that are listening to him on the mountain matthew 7 24 to 29 therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them i will liken to him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock the rain descends the floods come and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on a rock but whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand the rains descend the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and great was the fall of it and so it was that when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, we have an outline this evening. We're going to be looking, uh, the title is Wise Man, Foolish Man, Which One Are You? And there are two points to this outline. First of all, we'll see three similarities between the wise man and the foolish man. Then, secondly, we'll see three differences between the wise man and the foolish man. Now, remember last week we saw that profession minus possession equals what? Perdition. And we saw that there are those who have a profession of Christ. They profess him, Lord, Lord, but they don't have a possession. In fact, we saw there are those that even have a passion for Christ. Lord, we did this, and we did that, and we did all this stuff in your name. But they had passion, but no possession. And we saw that both of these, they have one end. And the end is perdition without Christ. In other words, they will be in everlasting punishment, which we know is eternal hell. We also saw it's only those who have profession and passion uh, and that will definitely have possession. So Jesus is still drawing his sermon to a conclusion, and these are his final words on the mount, as Matthew 8, 1 tells us that when this sermon was over, that he came down from the mountain and the crowds followed him. So let's begin, and as we do, Jesus will start with the wise man. He says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, Jesus begins with the words, therefore, which really point back to everything he has said in his sermon. Everything that he has said, starting from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to now. Therefore, he says, because of everything I have said to you in this sermon, then whoever hears has a choice. You can do what I say, or you can not do what I say. And ladies, notice there that whoever is universal. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be a Jew. You can be a Gentile. You can be a male. You can be a female. You can be rich. You can be poor. It doesn't matter who you are. What does matter is your response to what 
Jesus has said. Jesus says if you hear these things, he says, and do them, then you're what? You're wise. And ladies, notice, my friend, Jesus is clear that the sayings that he says are his as evidenced by the words mine, the sayings of mine. Ladies, I bring this out this evening to you because I am deeply, deeply concerned about women today that are listening to lots of stuff spoken by lots of people that profess Christ and read lots of books by so-called Christian authors, but they're not the sayings of Christ. Please be careful. Be careful that everything you hear, everything you read is backed up by the Lord. And in fact, if it's not backed up by what God says in his word, then you shouldn't be listening to it. You shouldn't be reading it. Jesus says, whoever hears and does the sayings of mine. Now, hearing is essential, but there is something that's more essential, and this is where the wise man is very different from the foolish man. Notice what Jesus says. The wise man does these things. Jesus says the person who hears and does is a wise man who builds his house on a rock. So ladies, if it's your desire this evening to be a wise woman, I don't know about you, I want to be wise. But Susan Heck is not going to be a wise woman without doing what Jesus tells her to do. Paul is very clear in Romans 2.13, For not the hearers of the law are justified, by, but what? The doers of the law are justified. Jesus says in another place in Luke 11.28, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then in John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. In fact, John says in the last book of the Bible, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates of the city. Ladies, we must not only hear, but we must do. And Jesus says, if you do these two things, then you're wise. Now, what does it mean to be wise? Well, it means a person who's discreet, a person who has understanding. In fact, we know from Job that he says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and apart from evil is understanding. And so Jesus says this person is wise and they're so wise that they build their house on a rock. In fact, the word here for rock is a massive rock, and it actually refers to a formation like a mountain or a cliff, which I think is really fascinating because as brought out so many times this year already, the mountain that Jesus was speaking on was what? A formation. It wasn't a huge mountain, but it was a pretty good-sized mount or a slope. And so this would indicate what? This rock is unmovable. And ladies, there is a passion uh, passage that we would do well to take heed to. 1 Corinthians 3 says, For we are God's fellow workers, we are his field, we are his building, according to the grace of God which is given to us. A wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let everyone take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. My friend, if your house is not built on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, you are not only unwise, but you're in great trouble, as we're going to see in just a minute. However, if your life is built on Christ, the solid rock, then you have no fear of what is to come. So Jesus speaks of what's to come in verse 25. The rains descend, the floods come, the winds blew, and they beat on the house, and it didn't fall, for it was founded on a rock. Now, if you live in Oklahoma like I do, you understand exactly what Jesus is saying. Oklahoma is known for its torrential winds and rains and floods. A few years ago, our church was even flooded. And so we understand what he is talking about. Torrential rains can have a serious impact on your home. And even if you don't live in Oklahoma, you understand what Jesus is saying because we, most of us have televisions and we've seen uh, homes in California during the torrential rains. They what? They slide down the hill, right? And they're massively destroyed. But a physical storm a real rainstorm doesn't seem to be what Jesus is talking about. You might say, well, Susan, how do you know that? Because the wise man, even a wise man, builds his house on a rock, right? A massive rock. And we know that what? Those homes are just as susceptible to sliding down a hill as those that are not built on a rock. 
Neither is Jesus talking about trials of life. This verse many times has been taken out of context to say, oh, well, when the storms of life come, then you'll be firm. Now, that's true, but that's not what he's talking about in the context here. Ladies, we need to consider the context, right? Jesus, what's he been saying throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount? When we understand what's been said, it's very simple to understand what he's talking about. He's keeping with his whole sermon, right? And especially the ending. There's two persons, two destinations, right? There's not three. There's only two. In fact, this would not be a new thought to the Jewish audience listening on the mount. They would more likely be thinking back to what is mentioned in Ezekiel 13. And in fact, I would like for you to turn down to Ezekiel 30, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel 13. Because what they would be thinking is the final judgment, the final judgment. They wouldn't be talking, thinking about a rainstorm or the trials of life. They're going to be thinking about judgment. Isn't that what Jesus has been talking about? In fact, look at Ezekiel. Hopefully you have it by now. Ezekiel 13, verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, therefore I am indeed against you, says the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who envision futility and who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, nor be written in the record of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. Then you shall know I am the Lord your God. Because indeed, because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, peace, and there is no peace. And one builds a wall, and they plaster it with untempered mortar. And they say to those who plaster it with untempered mortar that it will fall. There will be flooding and rain and hailstones, and a stormy wind will tear it down. Surely when the wall has fallen, will it not be said to you, where is the mortar which with you plastered it? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will cause a stormy wind to break forth in my fury, and there will be a flooding rain in my anger and great hailstones in fury to consume it. And I will break down the wall you've plastered with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that its foundation will be uncovered. It will fall. You will be consumed in the midst of it. You will know I am the Lord. I will accomplish my wrath on the wall and on those who plaster it with untempered mortar. And I will say to you, the wall is no more, nor those who plastered it. That is, the prophets of Israel who prophesy concerning Jerusalem and who see visions of peace for her when there is no peace, says the Lord God. Ladies, Jesus has been saying on the Sermon on the Mount the same thing that God said to those in Ezekiel's day. There are the true false, true prophets, there are the false prophets. There are true Christians, there are the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites. But one thing is true about everyone. We all will face eternity. We all will go and stand in judgment. Some will fall. Some will not. Ladies, the end is what Jesus has been speaking about, right, in the Sermon on the Mount. Two trees, two, two, trees, two fruits, two gates, two ways, two roads, two destinations. Just what Ezekiel is saying in the same way. In fact, there specifically... Uh, it's interesting because the Pharisees, in, in a way, thought they were building a wall that would last, just like a lot of religious people today. I meet all these people, and they say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. The life doesn't show it. But they think they're building this wall. And the storm is going to come, es eschatological, in the end. And they will not stand. Ladies, only those who are true servants of God will build carefully on a strong foundation that will stand. So the end comes, the final storm of life, so to speak. And the wise man whose foundation is built upon the rock of Christ can go through that final judgment, and she or he does not fall. Why? Because, notice, they're founded on the rock, the solid rock of Christ. Now, ladies, notice the house was saved because of the rock. The house is not saved because of anything you and I can do. Ladies, we are not saved by our own strength or pulling up our bootstraps. We're saved because of the rock. Jesus is the only one can save. The songwriter put it well. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is what? Sinking sand. In fact, Peter understood this. He talks about the chief cornerstone and we're God's building and we are to lay our foundation on no other than what? The cornerstone. Well, Jesus now will contrast the foolish man with the wise man, and we'll begin to see their similarities as well as their differences. 
Notice verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The lady's butt is a word of contrast. In contrast to the wise, we now have the foolish. The foolish also hear the sayings of Christ. Interesting. The fool hears the sayings. We have many of them in our pews today. So ladies, this is, if you're taking notes, this is the first thing that is similar to the wise man and the foolish man. They both hear the sayings of Christ. However, the wise man does something about what he hears. He obeys what he hears, but the foolish does not. And this is the first difference between them. They both hear, but they have different responses. One does them, and the other one does not. The wise man obeys. The foolish man does not. That's the first difference. But didn't Jesus say that already in the Sermon on the Mount? Remember when we were in Matthew chapter 5? Whoever breaks one of these least commandments and teaches other to do the same, the same is the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them will be what? The greatest in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Ladies, the words here in this verse do not mean an absolutely denial. The foolish man does not do them. What a sad indictment on many in our churches today. I know people, men and women, they come Sunday after Sunday, they hear the same sermons that I've heard, and they go out the door and they, their lives never change. They don't do them. Jesus says to his disciples in the upper room, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and will come and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And ladies, if we don't obey the Lord, we don't love him. Jesus calls those here in Matthew, those who do not obey his words, he calls them foolish. You know what that means? Moral blockhead, stupid, absurd. In fact, the Greek word is moros. We get our English word moron. Now, maybe you're saying, wait a minute, Susan, wait a minute. Um, didn't we study already in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus says, if you call anyone a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. And now he's saying that if you don't listen and obey the words of Jesus, you're a fool. I don't get it. Isn't Jesus contrad... Ah, I knew there was a contradiction in the Bible. Ladies, context, context. We all must remember context. In Matthew 5, remember... It was getting angry without a cause and having an unresolved offense with someone. The context here is those who don't obey what Jesus says. They're fools. In fact, Psalm 14, 1 is often taken out of context. which says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Do you know what the literal Hebrew interpretation of that is? The fool has said in his heart or her heart, no God, no. I know what you're saying but I'm not going to do it. So this fool, he built his house not on a rock, but on the sand. This is the second difference between the wise and the foolish man. They not only have different responses to Jesus' words, but they also have different rocks for their foundations. One is a solid rock. The other is a, little, a lot of itty-bitty uh, pebbles, we might say, mushy rock. In fact, sand is actually defined as loose granular substance composed of rock. So one is solid, the other one is mushy. But there's one more thing they have in common as we consider verse 27. The rains descend, the floods come, the winds blow and beat on the house, and it falls. And great was its fall. So the second thing the foolish and wise man have in common is they not only hear the same sayings, but they encounter the same storm. Interesting. Both the wise man and the foolish man will stand before God. Do you know no one is going to be exempt? Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Paul says in Romans 14.10, We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. No one is going to escape, whether you're wise or whether you are foolish. Ladies, Jesus is clear here. The foolish man's house falls, which means it crashes. And Jesus doesn't end there, but he says, and great is the fall of it. The Greek word is mega. I mean, this is a huge crash. 
eternal destruction. So ladies, the third difference between the wise and the foolish man, not only do they have different responses, not only do, do they have different rocks for foundations, but they have different results. One falls, one stands. Dear one, hearing the teachings of Christ without doing the teachings of Christ is dangerous. In fact, it's eternally dangerous. It can send you to hell. That's pretty serious. The only one who will be able to stand in judgment in those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, the ones who have bowed the knee to the Lordship of Christ. In fact, it's interesting in the physical sense. Do you know sand is easier to get a hold of? You know, you can kind of put it in your hands. It kind of falls through your fingers. It's, it's kind of easy to pick up, isn't it? But not a massive rock. You know, it's hard to get a rock, a big old rock, isn't it? But sand weighs less, and it's easier to maneuver. But didn't Jesus already say that? Ah, the broad way. Lots of people are going through there. Come on, let's go this way. But the narrow way, it's hard. It's hard to maneuver. It's strict. It's agonizing, kind of like that big rock. Well, it's only those who do what Jesus says who will be able to stand. It's only those whose house is built upon the rock who will not fall. In fact, a songwriter put it like this, in times you need a... In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And the songwriter goes on to say, this rock is Jesus. He's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Well, this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount, but it's not the end of what Matthew says as he ends with these words in verses 28 and 29. And here we see our third similarity between the wise and the foolish man. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching. So the sermon is over. Jesus has now ended what he has to say, but the people were astonished at his teaching, and rightly so. Ladies, you and I have been studying this now for 23 weeks. And I don't know about you, but it's astonishing, isn't it? I've had the Sermon on the Mount memorized for years, and I am astonished and convicted all over again as I've had to study these lessons and teach them. Now, what does it mean to be astonished? When it says the people were astonished, what it actually means they were struck out of their mind with astonishment. They were dumbfounded. They were amazed. So the third thing they have in common or similar is not only do they hear the same sayings, not only do they encounter the same storm, but they have the same response to Jesus' sermon. They're struck dumb. Isn't it interesting? Matthew doesn't divide the audience. He doesn't say, well, you know, the fools, they were struck dumb, but the wise, you know, they kind of go, yeah, this is a great sermon. They all were struck dumb, struck dumb out of their mind. Why? Why were they astonished, both rich, I mean, both wise and fools? Well, notice what Jesus says. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Ladies, do you know Jesus taught like no one else? In fact, wouldn't it have been great to actually have heard this sermon audibly by him? I can only imagine what it was like. But he taught with authority. He didn't teach like the scribes. Who were the scribes? Oh, they were the professionals of the day. They were the ones who went to seminary, we might say. You know, they learned all proper hermeneutics, and they studied theology, and, you know, they knew the proper things to say. They followed the letter of the law, but they had no power in their teaching. And that describes a lot of ministers today. In fact, the other day, my husband and I listened to a uh, friend of mine told me about a sermon going on in her church, and I came home, told my husband, and he goes, eh, couldn't have been that bad. And I said, well, hey, most sermons are online these, this day. Let's listen to it. So we got through about 10 minutes, and my husband said, turn that thing off. Not only was it heretical, but it was boring, downright boring. And that describes a lot of the ministers in the pulpit today. They have no power when they preach, they're, they're dull and they're boring. In fact, they tell us there are copies of the teachings of the rabbis that are so dull and boring, they have no life to them. Why? Because they have no eternal life. They have no power. They don't have the power of the Spirit of God, but not Jesus. He spoke with truth. 
He spoke with authority. He spoke with reality. In fact, one man describes it like the morning light. He had God's spirit. And ladies, this sermon made a profound impression upon the audience. There was no smoothing of the outcome. Well, as we wrap up, let's just review where we have gone as we end the Sermon on the Mount. There are three similarities between the wise and foolish man. Number one, they hear the same sayings of Christ. Number two, they have the same storm, which is eschatological judgment at the end. Number three, they have the same sobering response. They're struck dumb. Ladies, we also, whether we're foolish or wise, we have heard the sayings of Christ now for 23 weeks. We also have heard, I hope, through our lifetime, right? We also... Sitting here tonight, whether you're foolish or wise, every one of us in this room are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're either after that going to step into heaven or step into hell. We all, whether foolish or wise, have been struck dumb not only at this sermon we've studied, but much of God's word, which leaves us speechless. So the similarities that we have, whether we're foolish or wise, they're kind of hard to determine when we consider our salvation, am I saved? Because the wise and the foolish have some similarities. But there are three differences between the wise and the foolish man which should help us discern whether we're in the category of the wise or the foolish. They have three differences. The first one is they have different responses. One obeys what Jesus says. The other one does not. One has a solid rock that the house is built on. The other one is built on sand. And thirdly, one stands and enters into eternity with Christ, and the other one falls, and the fall is great. In fact, we looked at this a few weeks ago. The fall is so great that Jesus says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. Now you might say, Well, Susan, how do these differences help me to know whether I'm saved or not, because I may not know. I may be deceived right up until, until I get to heaven for that last, uh, before the judgment seat of Christ. True, that might be true. You might be one of those who are deceived to the very end. We may not know until the day of judgment whether our foundation is built on a rock or stand. But ladies, there is one issue that Jesus mentions here whereby you and I can know for sure if we are wise or foolish. And the issue is obedience, right? We either do what Jesus says or we don't do what he says. Now, ladies, we must remember, Jesus is not comparing saved with the lost. He's comparing those who are saved with those who think they're saved. They both heard Jesus' sayings, or we might say they both come to church, they hear sermons, they look the same, they know all the religious songs, they both teach Sunday school class, they both give of their tithes, but they make a different choice. My friend, you have heard the sayings of Jesus on the mount, but have you obeyed the sayings of Jesus on the mount? One man says, we sometimes admire the response of those who listened in amazement to Jesus' sermon and there is something admirable about it, but there's also something inadequate about it. Matthew pointedly refrains from telling us the people obeyed it. They thought it was the most admirable sermon they'd ever heard. Indeed, it is the most admired sermon in human history. But Jesus did not preach it in order for him to be admired by his homiletical skills. He preached it to produce obedience. He preached it so that the authority people recognized in his preaching might be realized in their lives. You have seen the authority in his sermon. Now, will you submit to it? End of quote. Ladies, as we close out our study on the Sermon on the Mount, I want to close with some words that Moses spoke to the children of Israel before he passed from this life to the next. Because really, he's kind of saying the same thing Jesus is, but in more of a condensed, condensed way. And so I want to read this to you by way of closing this evening. Moses says this, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. 
in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, so that you can live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land with which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, and you're drawn away, and you worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today you will surely perish. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live forever, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life, and he is the length of your days. Let's pray as we close out this time together. Father, I do thank you again, as I have already, for the study of the Sermon on the Mount. I thank you for loving your people enough, even those who were hypocrites, to bring forth such a powerful message. And Lord, I would not be foolish enough to think that there are not hypocrites that are listening even now to my words. And I pray, O oh God, that somehow, through the power of your Spirit and the power of your Word, that they would repent and Lord that they would possess the name they profess and Lord we know that without that possession there's only perdition and so Father I just thank you so much for this study I thank you for the ladies who have attended and I thank you for the joy that it has been to study your word together so Father give us the grace that we need now to go out and do the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm.